So what I'd like to do now is to walk through the presentation on metastability and synchronization techniques that we've been covering in 361. Hopefully these videos will help you to be able to study this at home and make sure you thoroughly understand the topics as we proceed into our projects and throughout the semester. So what is metastability? Metastability is a potentially hazardous event. It happens when you're dealing with synchronous digital design. I say synchronous digital design, that means that we're designing with flops. And we have flops have a common clock, all the flops have a common reset. And what I want to do is talk about what is metastability, what causes metastability, how does the designer encounter metastability, and when he does design it and encounter it, how does he deal with it? The first thing to understand is the behavior of a D flip-flop. So when reset is active, Q is always a zero. It doesn't matter what's happening on the clock or on the data. We call this an asynchronous reset, meaning as soon as reset goes active, Q goes to zero. When the reset has gone inactive, uh, then the flop becomes synchronous and the behavior is stated that on the active edge of the clock, the value on D is copied to Q. One thing to note is that typically when you're dealing with D flops, you're dealing with reset, which means you want the flop to come up in a zero when you start. There are occasions when you would like the opposite. You would like the flop to come up in a one. We would refer to that as a set, for all intents and purposes, it behaves exactly the same as the asynchronous reset, with the exception that the output is initialized to a 1. The construction of the flop has given us what we call timing constraints, which refers to how you interface to the flop itself. The first image shows the relationship between the active edge of the clock, which in this case is the rising edge. In our class, we will always use the positive edge of the clock. It doesn't mean in the world at large they only use the positive edge, but for us, we will focus and use the positive edge. So we call that the active edge of the clock because that's the edge that causes the flip-flop to respond. The constraint is given with respect to the data and its relationship to the active edge of the clock. There are two constraints. One is called setup, one is called hold. The setup is the period of time that the data input must be stable before the active edge of the clock. The hold is the period of time that the input must be stable after the active edge of the clock. So when you sum those two up, you could have your setup hold window. And basically the way to consider it is that the data can switch all the way up to the start of the setup time. It could switch after the hold time. But during the setup hold window, the data must remain stable. It is when transitions occur in that window that the flop may enter the metastable state. Another constraint that is imposed on synchronous design of flops is the relationship between the deassertion of reset and the active edge of the clock. Just to be clear, we all understand what I mean by deassertion. You are either going into reset when you assert the reset signal, or you're coming out of reset when you deassert the reset signal. In this case, the constraint is still with respect to the active edge of the clock. Again, it's very similar to the setup and hold, but now we call it recovery removal. The fundamental rule is the same as setup and hold. When you're leaving reset, when you're deasserting reset, you cannot release the reset in that window. If you release, you switch the reset in that window, the flop may go metastable. 
So what we've seen in these last two charts is that there are two sources of metastability with a D-flop. The first could be the data input. The second is the reset. And the second with the reset is of concern because in digital design, it's important for us to know the state that we start in. Any confusion, any metastability will cause us to not start up in the expected state and can very likely undermine the whole behavior of the digital circuit. So what is metastability? And these are just a few questions that I ask to help make sure everybody understands what it is we're doing. Metastability is when the output of a flop enters what is called the metastable state. And it is assumed that this state is transient meaning that it will last less than one clock period. So in our case, our design has a 100 megahertz clock. That means the period is 10 nanoseconds. So if indeed one of our flops enters the metastable state, it will settle in less than 10 nanoseconds. When it does settle, it will settle in an unpredictable state. What I mean by that is, if you are driving the data input to a 1, you are expecting the output to go to 1. But if while driving the data input to a 1, you violate the setup and hold requirements and cause the flop to go into the metastable state, when the flop settles, you do not know whether it would settle as a 1 or a 0. This is what is meant by when you're coming out of the metastable state, it will settle in an unpredictable state. You don't know what state it is. This diagram is from a paper I found online. Jason Smith and Professor Fred Cady posted it a long time ago, but I like the diagram. And the diagram shows the cue of a flop responding to numerous violations of the setup and hold. The image is captured on what is called a storage scope in that it repeatedly sweeps and doesn't overwrite the previous uh, uh, trace. So you can see how over time what happened. So in each case, the flop is attempting to switch, attempting to go to a 1 at the beginning. Then at some point, it loses its way. And it begins to go up and down. We don't know exactly what the pattern looks like. I don't like to use the word oscillate. Uh, but there is this period of time, oscillation is okay, that you are in the metastable state. But then you can see when the line up and the line down becomes dark again, that is where the flop has settled. Notice sometimes it settles as a 1, sometimes it settles as a 0. So we've talked about the fact that we are creating synchronous digital design. The reset goes to our reset input. The clocks go to our clock input. We've stated we never take the cue of one flop and take it in the clock of another flop. But we can see what's happening in our synchronous digital design is that we have a clock frequency. For us, it's 100 megahertz. So we have a clock period of 10 nanoseconds here designated by T. And what the period does, it establishes the budget, meaning you're going to have to spend time moving the data from one flop to the next. All of the work must be done such that you do not violate the setup or hold time at the second flop. So the consumers, starting from the left, first are the clock to Q time. And what I'm referring to is the time it takes Q1 to respond to a change on D1. The clock to that flop initiates it. There is a certain finite period of time until Q switches. 
The diagram is not proportional, but it's drawn just to help us understand what is transpiring. Then once Q1 switches, it needs to enter the combinational array, shown by a cloud. Sometimes we call it a combinational cloud, sometimes we call it a con combinational cone. But inevitably, what it represents is an array of gates. And what will happen is when the inputs to the array of gates switch, that causes the signals to propagate through all the gates inside of the cloud. Then there will come a time when it stops switching. We call that the T-prop, the period of time it takes for the signals to pass through the cloud and be stable at the output. The output here is D2, which is the input to the second flop. The requirement there is that it must be stable the setup time before the next active edge of the clock. And as shown in the diagram, when we have a circuit behaving like this, everything is fine. We can sum up the clock to Q, the propagation delay, the setup delay. Then when we do the math, we subtract that sum total from the period, we should have a positive number. In industry, we refer to that number as the margin or the slack. And we say that there must be a positive margin or a positive slack. How do you, when you're doing your digital design, encounter metastability in this situation? The fundamental issue is trying to do too much work. And what is meant by that? The structure of the circuit, you have no real flexibility with respect to the clock to queue. You have no flexibility with respect to the setup time. Where you do have flexibility is the propagation delay through the combinational logic. And the more you try to do, the more functions you add to that combinational cloud, it will inevitably take more time. And the timing diagram below on this slide is meant to show a situation where we have the same clock to queue, but this time we're trying to do too much in that combinational cloud. And it creeps into the period that's allocated to the setup time. That means now, when we do the math, we no longer have a positive margin, but now we have a negative margin. This will cause the second flop to enter the metastable state. And in truth, we should find this situation out while we are doing our design. It will not show up when we're doing the functional verification of our design, which we're learning about in the second third of our course but it will show up when we're doing the timing analysis of our design, which is what we'll do in the third section of our class. So here, suffice it to say, what causes metastability is violating the timing constraints of the flop. In this case, it's Q2. The situation in this instance is we violate the timing constraints because we do not meet the timing requirement of having the signal stable at the setup time. So this is one approach to encountering metastability. Typically in my discussions I call this bad design. Now bad is not necessarily the best word, but it's it shows that the problem is induced by the structure of the design not in any of the required behavior of the design. So how do we fix bad design? So we have a few choices. The first choice is you could slow the clock down. So that would mean you have a smaller frequency, which would mean you have a larger period. So you would have more time then to accomplish the work that needs to be done. The problem with that is you typically choose your clock frequency based on some system requirement and it's not such a simple thing just to say, oh, instead of 100 megahertz, I'm going to run it 10 megahertz, uh, let's say in a gross example. So the first is, and if you could, and there's no reason why not to do it, slow the clock down. The second is you might be able to find faster technology. In our case, we're using the Xilinx devices, the RX devices. Uh, 
Xilinx has other families, the vertex device family, which behave much quicker and have a much faster clock. So then, since it's not necessarily the faster clock, it's the faster behavior of the circuits, that might be enough to solve your problem so that the circuits would switch faster than they did when you failed. Now you would meet your time. The third and most probably uh, uh, used approach to dealing with it is that you need to redesign your circuit. And one technique is in the middle of that combinational cloud, you insert a flop and you break the workup that you're trying to do in one clock into two clocks. And of course, again, it depends on the architecture of your circuit. The second manner in which the designer encounters metastability is more of necessity, meaning that there's a situation that I need to have this implementation. I'm going to violate my timing constraints, but I need to know how to deal with it. So we refer to this as crossing clock domains. And what that means is that you may have a design where you have one flop clocked at a 50 megahertz clock, and his output is supposed to be received by another flop, but the second flop is being clocked at a 66 megahertz. So you can see in the diagram up above, there's no way to enforce an edge to edge relationship between the two clocks. So it's very possible that the clock 50 switches, causing Q50 to switch within the setup hold window of the 66 megahertz flop, causing the 66 megahertz flop to enter the metastable state. So the question is not here, can I redesign to get around this, but what do I do to allow me to communicate from one clock domain to the next? Where you might encounter is a situation where the big block may represent a design, a chip. In it, there's an embedded processor with its memory, both running at 50 megahertz. You have your I.O. and some custom circuitry, sometimes I call it the secret sauce, running at a different frequency. And now you need to communicate between the two domains. This discussion is addressing that particular situation. The signal from the sending domain must be able to be sampled in the receiving domain. So what I show here by bad and good. So clock R represents the clock on the flop that is receiving the signal. QS represents the Q from the sending flop. Notice if the clock frequency of the first of the sending flop is so fast that you are able to switch the signal high and switch the signal low in a period of time less than the period of the receiving clock, there is a likelihood that you would never see the signal. The signal would come and go before you could register the fact that it occurred. So that is represented by the fact that this pulse goes high and low, never seeing the active edge of the receiving clock arc, doesn't see it. So how do we do it and what's our first rule for the solution here is that the signal that is being sent that we want to receive must be able to be sampled in the receiving domain. That means he must be able to see it. The solution that we have is we have our signal Q50. In this case, he's going to go high and remain high a long time, ensuring that we are able to sample it in the 66 domain. We can see that what I've done is added a second flop. And I've named the first flop on the 66 megahertz domain Q meta. And what I mean by that is that we accept the fact that the flop will be, have its timing constraints violated and the output of that flop may go metastable. 
What we also assume is that if indeed it does, it will settle in either a 1 or a 0 in less than one clock period. The diagram down below shows both cases. The signal clearly is supposed to go to a 1. In the first case, the metastability settles at a 1, and we see our signal on the second clock. In the second case, the signal settles at a 0, then goes high on the next clock, and then QOK receives it on the following clock. So we call this technique, we call this a synchronization flop. And the rule is twofold. One, you must be able to sample the signal. That's Q50 coming in. And two, we never use Q meta for anything. We know that that guy is going to go metastable, but we also know that he's going to settle in less than one clock period. So QOK will always see a data input that meets its timing constraints. So the best approach is to hold the signal from the sending domain until it knows that the receiving domain has received it. That is for your architecture. If we look at the paper, the Ten Commandments of Digital Design, there's a nice circuit in there showing how the handshaking between the transmission and the receiver work to enable us to assure ourselves that we are able to see the signal that was sent. A very common approach is to utilize an edge detection circuit presented in class to detect the transition. So we're going to see this on the next slide. And there should be more considerations of this, but for us, this will be adequate. So a little bit of a diversion here, but we'll get back to the subject is crossing clock domains brings in the topic of digital design and of course processor design is a big aspect of part of digital design in CECS 440 you should be using a textbook by two gentlemen Hennessy and Patterson and I think it's an excellent book and in the book they break up digital design as two parts data path and control Data path refers to the information that's being exchanged. Control refers to how that data is being exchanged. So what I've grabbed on the bottom is a page from their textbook that shows the architecture of a simple MIPS processor. And you can see the differentiation in colors. All of the black areas are meant to be the data path portion of the design. All the light blue are meant to be the control. And of course, the control signals are typically coming from some type of a controller, a perhaps a state machine. And it's the controller's responsibility to move the data through your system at the appropriate time. So it's interesting to see what the control is. It's the MUX select. It might be a load. It might be a read line. These are all the functions of the control lines. When we are crossing clock domains, typically you're moving some type of data. If you're just sitting in a control line, then the upper portion, the control path is adequate. But if you're communicating data, normally you would do something like this. And what I'm saying is the data path, that might be a 32-bit bus. So the tendency might be to think, oh, I need to add synchronization circuits to all 32 data bits. No. The only thing that needs the synchronization circuit added to is the control line. It's the control line is what's going to tell the receiving circuit that data has been sent to them and that they need to sample it. When I say sample, that means to assert the signal load 66P, which will load the register with the data coming from the 50 megahertz domain. Now you can see that there are several clocks involved for that signal to be generated all the while all the 
the QData50 will have had plenty of time to be sitting at the input of the register on the bottom so that there's no timing constraints there. So this is basically an overview of my lecture. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to have some more discussions to get into it. But if you take the time to dig in to the presentation, the concept should become clearer. If you have any questions, let me know. We talked about it in class.